Hi, I'm Hannah. I live in Denver with my two partners and I use they them pronouns. And I'm actually going to start out with a very short piece of writing written by a trans woman who is a animal activist and vegan because we actually don't have any trans women who are represented in our speakers today. So I'm going to pull that up. Oops. When I knew that I was ready to medically transition, I wasn't able to. I had to go to a therapist a bunch of times just to get this letter saying what I already knew, that I was suffering from gender dysphoria. Then I had to take this letter to an endocrinologist to put up with blood draws, condescension, and questioning, questioning, questioning every step of the way. It's not like it was something I had never thought about. I had wanted to be a girl since I was seven. Anyway, before all of that, before I even went to see a therapist, I remember being in my kitchen moping at the insurmountable task of just getting people to let me do what I felt was right, to live freely in the way that I found most fulfilling. I wish the world was more compassionate and more loving towards others. But as I had these thoughts, I stared at the kielbasa I was microwaving for lunch. Why didn't I have the compassion and love for the animals that the sausage was made from? How could I justly seek my own liberation while denying that to others? I just want the world to respect my autonomy and my choices as a trans woman, and that respect should be extended to all beings. So that's kind of how I want to open. I'm really kind of interested in linking the str struggles for liberation between queer and trans and non-human animals. So we'll begin. So one thing that I've noticed in the mainstream animal rights movement and the mainstream animal, um, sorry, one thing that I've noticed in the mainstream LGBT movement and the mainstream animal rights movement is that there's kind of two different strategies for messaging. So on the, in the one hand, I find that you often have animals presented as animals and people represented as cute, totally like us, totally like you and your family and your pets, um, innocent, pure, relatable, normal, deserving of our compassion because you can relate to them and you feel like they're like you. And the other thing that I've noticed is that we represent LGBTQ people and animals as tragic and subjected to so much violence and discrimination and tragedy. And I feel like both of these strategies of representing them as cute and relatable and normal and also um, victims of tragedy and violence are, is actually harming us seeing them as individuals and is actually harming our liberation movements. So um, I know it's kind of hard to see this, the text in here, but I can sort of explain it to you. So this is the charmed circle of um, sex and relationships, and it actually ties back very well to what Dominique was just talking about. So in the inside, you have characteristics of sex and relationships that are desirable and on the outside you have characteristics of sex and relationships that are undesirable. So on the inside you have you know monogamous and procreative and um, married and white and with families and then on the outside you have um, characteristics that are less desirable like um, you know POC and not being married and being more promiscuous and not coupled, but actually in, um, you know, poly relationships and things like that. And so the inside is actually what we see most in the LGBT movement, the, the, the LGBT people, the gay and lesbian people who are most able to assimilate into the heterosexual world. And I feel like we could actually apply this kind of model to the animal, um, the animal rights movement and we think about what types of animals are the most prioritized and given the most visibility and it would be those most relatable and cute animals. So this is a picture of Dean Spade who is a transgender activist who I admire a whole lot and so he introduced me to this idea of trickle up social justice which is um, in contrast to trickle-down social justice. And so in trickle-down social justice, the kind of strategy is that you take the people who are, like I said, most, um, most acceptable to mainstream society, like, you know, white, 
um, monogamously partnered gay and lesbian people with families who are married. And then you, you kind of hold them up as representat representatives of the entire movement. And so the idea is that if we hold up these, um, you know, very assimilationist and very, the most um, acceptable examples of, of um, like basically LGBTQ people in the movement, then eventually the, the sort of rights will trickle down from them, the people who have most privilege, and then trickle down to the bottom and then reach the bottom. And then eventually everyone will have, um, everyone will have rights and have respect. But that's actually not how it works. Because what happens is, because, is when you prioritize the people who have the most privilege and then you represent them as the face of the LGBT movement, it's actually further marginalizing for the people who have less privileges. So the POC, the trans people, the people with disabilities, people in non-monogamous relationships and that kind of thing. And so this idea of trickle up social justice instead of trickle down social justice, which is what I just described, is that ethically what we need to do is start with the people who have the least, the least privilege, the people who are facing the worst conditions, the most violence, the people who are most marginalized. And if we make an effort to meet their needs and eliminate violence against them, then we'll actually meet the needs of everybody. Because if we, if we meet the needs of the people who, um, who have the least and who need the most, then we'll take care of everyone. And so if we apply the trickle up social justice model to the animal liberation movement, we should think about addressing the violence against the most marginalized and oppressed animals first. I think about the fact that there are a lot of people who are really into ending um, animal abuse against dogs and cats who aren't vegan, right? And so dogs and cats are the animals that people are more familiar with, the, the, the animals that kind of fit best into our lives. And so if we think about actually meeting the needs of the animals that are most marginalized and actually, actually imagining a world that does not use any kind of animals for entertainment or clothing or food or anything like that, we should really be thinking about, you know, violence against the chickens and the pigs and the cows and elephants and um, fish and um, wild animals and animals in every kind of segment of animal exploitation and industry instead of just the ones that are most relatable to us. So I think about the fact that, you know, in the discussion of SeaWorld and Blackfish, we hear so much more about orcas than we do about fish. And so we're really prioritizing those animals that we feel more connected to because they share certain characteristics that we value. And so I didn't actually um, want to show a picture of <coughs> violence against animals because, like I said, I think that showing um, very commodifying and depersonifying images of animals is just not something that we should do. I think that when you show images of animals being subjected to violence, it's further distances the viewer from those animals. And I would like to see the animal rights movement really relying on a lot more empathy and wanting to connect to those animals in, as individuals and actually wanting to value every single animal life, no matter how similar or dissimilar they are to us. And so I think that what we should be doing is representing animals in ways that really show their individuality and highlight their stories of liberation and tell tales of joy. And so this is an image of, of my girlfriend and a cow at an animal sanctuary in Colorado. And I feel like it really shows them connecting and it shows the cow um, really enjoying himself and just being so glad to be, be in that beautiful place. And so this is the kind of thing that I feel like we should, you know, the types of images that we should be showing. 
So, like I said, um, either prioritizing the most cute and relatable individuals or showing only tales of violence is harming our liberation movements. And by prioritizing and promoting compassion for only the smartest, most beautiful, most innocent, we marginalize those individuals who don't fit those hegemonic standards of assimilation and desirability within our own movement. So we marginalize trans people, undocu undocumented queer people, people of color, disabled individuals, formerly incarcerated people, drug users, sex workers, and we marginalize non-human animals who are less friendly, less intelligent by our standards, and less attractive to us. And when we are presenting these stories of or when we are not presenting stories of people and animals who have successfully assimilated into this cis-normative, heteronormative, human-centric system, we present these stories of violence and tragedy, and we show images and tell of the unending murders of queer and trans people and non-human animals. And it's true that violence and discrimination is part of some of our stories, but when we talk about only the violent ends, it strips away our depth and personhood. And so it's better to communicate our personhood, tell empowered stories of joy, liberation, and community that don't depend on individuals being cute by hegemonic standards of desirability. So this image I really like, and I feel like my um, work as a prison abolitionist is also very connected to being a vegan and animal liberationist, because I would really like to see this world where um, people and non-humans are not... Um, are not caged and are not um, exploited for other, other others' use. And so my goal is total animal, queer, and trans liberation because everybody is valuable. Everybody deserves to live a life of joy and freedom, free from fear and violence. Everyone deserves bodily autonomy to express themselves fully in the company of their loved ones. We envision a world where no one is imprisoned for punishment or profit where we'll, we are able to heal from past trauma and support one another's well-being and safety. We can develop alternatives to incarceration, resist profiling by violent state institutions, laws and policies pr targeting particular breeds or activities as inappropriate or unsafe, and house compassion for all, even those of us who are not as innocent or pure as those who are often held up as um, representing mainstream advocacy movements. That is all. <laughs>